It's one of our big marriage feast gospels. There's two in Matthew. Well, there's two. They're almost the same in Matthew and Luke. This one comes towards the end of Matthew's gospel, where Jesus is really laying into the people who have been resisting him, trying to trap him, trying to arrest him, and now they're trying to kill him. Matter of fact, right after this uh, parable about the wedding feast, they get together with the Herodians. This is the priests, not just scribes and Pharisees. Now the priests are starting to pour on the hate, and they're getting together with <laughs> the people who have no conscience. Uh, and Jesus just seems to go, this is chapter 22, and the next few chapters till we get to 25 when the talking's over and they get him, they arrest him. Uh, he seems to be provoking them. But when you read the whole gospel, you see he's been so patient. He's tried everything. He's proved from the, from the scriptures. He's proved from his miracles. He's proved from his life. He's done everything to reach out to these guys and they get harder and more hateful and more resentful. And now they're really, really going, they're making serious plans. The marriage feast, what is a marriage feast? When you come across a marriage feast in scripture, all scripture, even the Old Testament. Matter of fact, I didn't know this till I got here about 20 years ago. The most quoted book in the Bible, that's by especially artists and mystics, is the Song of Songs, which is all about a love affair and a honeymoon, the whole book. And it's God with his people, it's God with Israel, it's Jesus with your soul, it's Jesus with all of us together as his bride. All that's playing into this. But he's especially talking about who's in my church and who's going to get saved and who's going to choose to be damned after I reach out. So here's, as I go, I'll hit some of the, uh, the uh, details that tell us something about us. Because this isn't just about the old days. This isn't just Jesus with those guys that were resisting him. This is the church as, he, as she is through salvation history, as she is right now for us. Um, Is the church good or bad? Hmm. Who can tell me the short answer? I know there's smarty, plenty of smart holy ones out there. Short answer is she's good and bad because she comes from the Father's. She's the Father's plan. She's accomplished, consummated by Jesus, and now she's guided and led by the Holy Spirit. They're all perfect, so that what they do is perfect. But guess who's in this church? Yeah. Can you believe it? He's in here too. Even she's here. Uh, so the church is ugly, dirty, stinky, sinful. Well, which is she really? She's really both. As long as she's on the way, she has all of our ugly stuff in her. And in her, not out of her. You can take yourself out. You can get yourself excommunicated. Not by the Pope, but you can do it by breaking the right kind of mortal sin and get yourself taken out, but you'll look like you're still here, you'll still be in church, you'll still be carrying your rosary around, you'll be headed for hell, but you're still in a way connected to the body of Christ and you are part of his bride. But you're not the beautiful part like his mother. You're some of the other junk. Well, which is it, where am I? Well, we get some kind of an idea here with these groups that are talked about. This king, this is not anybody's wedding. This is the biggest wedding anybody's ever heard of. A king had a son who's getting married. And he's get butchered all his best animals, all his livestock. He's got everything ready. He's already sent out invitations. Now he sends out, the invitation wasn't enough. Because, you know, he didn't get all the RSVPs he wanted, but he got a lot of them. But he's going to go out and he says, get everybody I sent an invitation to and get them in here. Tell them how great it's going to be. And what happens? Well, the first group are people that, Gee, I'd really love to go. It sounds great. You're, you're a great king. Your son's fabulous. But I, my business, you know, got all these meetings and everything. Uh, and my farm, I just bought five yoke of oxen. Got to check them out, you know. I'd really love to be there. I'll, I'll send a gift, though. The king doesn't like this reply. So now he sends guys out directly, people, servants. Who are these servants? Two groups. The old prophets of the old way, the old covenant. And now the last of them, Jesus' cousin, has just been killed. And they go, and what happens to them? 
Now they're not these people, the people, the, the hardcore refusers. How many showed up for the wedding? We don't know. And Jesus never answers that question. They ask him that. Are only a few going to be saved? He won't answer it. He says, try to enter by the narrow gate. Don't try to enter by the wide gate. It's not going to be happy. Um, so who, who is the second group? The second group not only just said thanks but no thanks, they insulted, abused, manhandled, beat up, thumped, and killed, stoned and killed some of his messengers sent directly to invite them to this great party. Now he's mad. This is where Matthew's gospel, which comes later in Jesus' life, uh, departs from the text a little bit we get in Luke. He goes and sends his army. Remember, he's the king. He's in charge of everything. This isn't just an invitation. You can come to the Valentine's Day party or not. No, no. This is big. This is an invitation with a sting in it. He sends his army to kill those murderers, those ones who beat up his servants and killed some of them, kill them and burn their city. Now we're getting into a little bit of something they call eschatology. This is not, this, it's, a, it's a parable. And it takes parts of real life stuff that happened and it tells us about the future. That's what the uh, eschatology is, the end times. This is what was going to happen to Jerusalem, the city that he's going into and getting threatened and getting persecuted and about to be arrested in. Before this generation is gone, this whole place will be rubble, not one stone on another because of your response to this invitation of love. So there's a consequence. It's not like, well, I can go to the wedding feast or I cannot go to the wedding feast. Eh. You better be there. Um, then he sends his uh, servants out again, the last group, and says, go out to the roads, go out to the uh, crossroads, go out even into the uh, country streets. And in Luke, he says, go out into the hedges. You know, get the street people, get the people asleep, hung over in the alleys, get everybody up, good and bad. That's how you know it's the church. That's us, good and bad. And get them into my party. And now the place is finally filled. <laughs> and some of these people don't even know what they're there for. And he walks in, the king, and he sees a guy not in a wedding garment. Now, we, don't, we wouldn't know what that means. But even if you were a poor Jew, you would hustle somewhere or you'd come up with something so you'd have some extra wedding garments, festal uh, uh, gowns, so that if somebody was poor or traveling, you, you wouldn't have to be embarrassed. So if this guy is there, one guy, that's in the party, he's already made it in, that means he's baptized, he's in the church, and he's at the feast, but he's not dressed right. I remember when I used to hear this when I was a kid, I always thought, gee, they were kind of hard on him. He's probably poor. No, no. If he didn't have on a wedding garment, it meant he wouldn't put one on. And so that's adding insult to injury to new insult. And what does the king say? Take this wretch, tie him up, and throw him out into the dark where he can wail and gnash his teeth. Now, this doesn't sound like real sweet what, what you think of a, as a, a, a honeymoon story or a, uh, some of the best parties I ever went to. Uh, matter of fact, the best parties I ever went to were always Catholic weddings, especially if it was two gorgeous virgins. And they loved God and they loved each other. And you could just see good stuff was coming. Like, you don't see it every wedding that you go to. Um, but how come all this dark stuff? Because it's, it's the image of the wedding banquet and then the honeymoon, that's great. But what got us to that point and what's going on, because this is not just, I say, not just about a nice story or just a, something that happened way back. It's where we are now. We're on the way. Am I going to be in that wedding feast? I'm in the church. I'm a sinner. I'm trying to be better. I'm trying to break some of my bad habits and turn them into virtues, but I'm awful slow about it. And just because I've been baptized, just because I'm in the church, I have been invited to the wedding feast. And unless I deliberately mess it up with sin, and especially serious sin, I'm going to end up there. Um, 
what's the point overall? Because it's, it's, it's one of Jesus' medium-sized to longer uh, parables. But uh, the message for us, we're the church on the way. We're not home. There's no such thing as what Protestants call blessed assurance, irresistible grace, no such thing. You're choosing every day. And you're choosing yourself or you're choosing God in a million little forms and sometimes bigger forms. So your, sal your justification and your salvation are not assured unless you are making the right choices. That means you've got to show up, not just with the, uh, here's the thing I got in the mail, RSVP, I have it here, they send it right to my house. Uh, that's not enough, we'll let you in the door. Then they're gonna say, how come you're dressed like a slob? How come you smell bad? What's that? Again, it's not because the guy was too poor to go to Target and get himself a, a wedding garment. Uh, it's because his life stunk. He was evil. He wasn't righteous. He didn't love God. He didn't put other people in front of himself. So he gets thrown out, tied up and thrown out to wail and gnash his teeth. Somebody who was, looked like it till the very end in the church. So this is the last stuff I'm gonna leave you with. Some of these things, some of these things are Americanisms and some of them are Catholic, Christian, tradition, scriptural. But these are the things you see, when you hear them, you'll, you'll recognize some of them immediately. You'll see how they're alike. And these are things to be asking yourself all the time. What do you mean all the time? I mean every day. Get up in the morning and ask yourself some of these things. Because you're, you're either, you may be in the church, but you may not be in the church forever. There are people barking in hell who were popes and bishops and cardinals and great theologians. I mean, I hope there aren't, but they certainly had the choice. If they're not there, it's not God's fault. It's not the king's fault. Um, what kind of things help us to get a focus on so that we don't just sort of drift, show up to church on Sunday, maybe say a rosary once in a while, pray over the pot roast, is that enough? Not in this culture. You got too many enemies. First things first. Jesus always had his priorities right. God. He said, don't be like the pagans, worried about your food, worried about your clothes, worried about where you're going to live, worried about your hair, worried about your car, worried about your career. Worry about pleasing God. Worry about stopping your sins, especially your serious sins. Get them out of your life entirely. Not well, yeah, I want to get, you know, I should really break that habit. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm trying. Try more. Try harder. Um, carpe diem, that's a Latin uh, phrase, means seize the day, seize the hour, seize the minute, seize this mass to say, Jesus, I don't even know all that's wrong with me. Please show me. So when I get to that banquet, with you and your beautiful bride, nobody will be saying, throw him outside. Um, here's one of a woman, wonderful Catholic mom who raised a lot of kids and did a pretty good job of it. And she used to tell her kids, uh, especially if they were being lazy, procrastinate, uh, putting off, uh, miss, you know, going months without going to confession, uh, the room was a mess. All that stuff that probably none of you would recognize except you saw it on a TV show. Um, she would say, she, she would just give them the look and they knew it was coming. I know. What? Wash one dish. Yeah, but I'm not sure if I, because I, I have that bill I and mean, I've still got to get a job interview and, I said, and my back's killing me. And I, when you find yourself thinking a lot, thinking and talking to yourself and sitting in a chair or lying in a bed, Get up and do something. Like one of my bosses in construction used to say, when he'd come, concrete's hard setting up in, a, in the truck and a wall's not full of nothing but air and guys are just scratching themselves and looking at each other and smoking cigarettes. And he'd look around for a while and you could see him getting hot, I'll always say, he'd go, somebody do something even if it's wrong. Do something. Quit making resolutions, planning, promising. Those are all good beginnings, but they're supposed to be just beginnings. You're supposed to move on because we're in danger. We're in danger. We're under attack here. 
Um, these things that I've just said, they all come under this same uh, uh, genre of Jesus' own words. Like when he would say, what was the thing he chewed people up for the most? It was the same thing that he praised them for. No faith or faith. I've never seen faith like this guy's faith. None of you guys have faith like his. He's a foreigner and he's got strong faith. You guys are always doubting me. You guys are always doubting God. He says, do you have eyes that can't see? Do you have ears but they don't work? How many times does he say that in the Gospels? Um, beware of leaven. What does that mean, beware of leaven? Beware of yeast. The yeast of the Pharisees, the yeast of Herod. What the heck does that mean? Yeast of Herod. That means the creepy, corrupt stuff from this creepy, disgusting, sleazy world that's always working in the dark, over time, quietly, just like termites in the house. It's undermining, it's eroding. It's going to take you and your life down. Unless you got the lights on, you're hiring the exterminator, you're checking that batch so that it's not getting leavened by something strange, not nice yeast that you meant to put in there. Um, how many times and how many ways does he say, watch, pray, watch and pray, watch one hour with me? Couldn't you watch one hour with me? He's about to be tortured to death and his buddies are all. <laughs> Couldn't you watch an hour? When he says the, the parable about the, uh, the guy who's a good, another landowner like this king, and he's got a crop of wheat, it's in, and it starts coming up, and then it comes up, and then after it gets maybe a foot high, it said, that doesn't all look like wheat, that looks sort of like wheat. What is that stuff? Darnel, or whatever, there's like four or five names for it. But it looks just like wheat in the beginning. And his servants go, hey, we planted wheat, right? What, what happened? And he goes, I see the hand of an enemy in this. While men were sleeping, the weeds got in there, the trash that's going to ruin the wheat crop. That's happening all the time. Unless you are taking the initiative and looking for that trash in your well-tended uh, field, it won't be so well-tended. You're going to get some ugly stuff that you won't want to eat and your kids won't be able to eat. Um, we don't want to meet Jesus when we really see him. Not in a statue, not in a Mel Gibson movie, but face to face and be trying to look, trying to bury ourselves and look in the dirt and say, oh, oh, this is who you are. This is what you're like. No, no, no. We want to know him and we want to see him and look at him with eyes of love when we see him, when we get to that big party, that at the beginning of his honeymoon with us. And the honeymoon is not for us to be guests at. It's he, we're his brides. Each one of us, each of our souls is Jesus' bride. And all of us corporately are the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. Well, how can that work? I don't know. But he's trying to tell us something. In other words, nothing better than, a, uh, nothing more intimate, nothing more warmer, stronger, more loving, more delight in this world than a man and woman that really gave themselves 100% to each other. That's what's ahead for us unless we mess it up. Talk to him when you're going to come up and receive him in a minute. Say, Jesus, help me to see me a little better. Show me the work you want me to do. It won't be too much. You'll be able to do it. He'll show you how to do it. So you won't have to worry. When you, when you leave this place, You'll be, in that, you'll be in a honeymoon forever. Way better than the best honeymoon that any of us ever dreamt of or knew anybody have.